Okay. So, so Nick, no more powers here. So presumably that uh, sort of reassures you. Well, the worrying thing is the fact that we have heard back-channel conversations in and around governments where there are civil servants and there are officials who would like that and who would like the ability for not to go through the courts but to decide on their own merits that ISPs should abide by blacklists. So for certain websites to not be accessible through UK ISPs. The problem, as, as was described in the, the US around the SOPA and PIPA debate, was that the technical impact of that could actually make the internet more dangerous, both damaging basic consumer protection, but also driving underground the material that you're really trying to stop. So while it's very good that the, the committee's report didn't take these steps, our fear is that this duty to monitor, to check everything you do online, to check you're not doing something you shouldn't be doing, is being talked about more and more in and around Westminster. Mm. Jack, so, I mean, Nick mentioned the, the SOPA and PIPA, which are the, the pieces of legislation in the United States, that are, which are attempting to uh, limit the freedom of use of the internet, primarily actually in the first instance, I think, for commercial reasons rather than for political censorship. But do you think there's some kind of possible overlap here in the future that we, that we should worry um, about the, the commercial restrictions on the use of the net because the same techniques can then be used in the future politically? Sure, I think there's definitely the potential for slippage between things that are conducted in the name of counter-terrorism and the protection of commercial interests, for example. So you might find that there is more than an overlap. There is a, a worrying uh, coming together of these separate areas of legislation. I think um, it's worth focusing a little bit on some of the issues the report raises um, beyond the internet as well. Because while saying that the internet is uh, potentially a, a cause rather than a conduit of radicalization in some way, one of the few things uh, that Prevent has actually agreed upon and the new Home Affairs report has agreed upon is that grievance is something that seems to uh, unite people who are vulnerable to a process of radicalization. There's very little else that they've actually been able to kind of hang their hat on and say this is something that unites a demographic or whatever. Grievance seems to be the only thing. And yet there's very little there to deal with that fundamental issue of grievance in the first place. There's a focus instead on uh, something that is a conduit. The internet is used, I'm sure, for the instances and purposes of radicalization. But what isn't the internet used for now? You could replace the end of the sentences uh, that deal with the internet with many other things about yeah, contemporary British sure. life. Oh, there yeah. you go. So um, to my mind, having worked out one of the few things that does unite this problem, it then focuses on something that is somehow related and a part of the process, but that actually isn't at the root cause of this. Mm. Uh, well, Julian, let me ask you to re partly to respond to that, 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 um, that communication isn't grievance and that communication isn't cause, um, and, and that this is really what needs to be, needs to be looked at. Um, I, I mean, I think that there is an interesting comment. I mean, the, the internet thing has got a huge amount of coverage. I've just been looking through the report. Actually, there are uh, two paragraphs in the conclusions that deal with the internet, and all the rest deals with all sorts of other things. Um, and I think the way you deal with that sense of grievance is actually dealt with in various other sections, and it's about engagement. It's about talking to people. What we found was that there were people who just felt a bit detached from what was happening in society, in Parliament and in government. And in fact, the, the work of the Prevent, I, I, it'll be interesting to see whether it can be saved, because it was very much presented as being a tool for government to control Muslims. Uh, which I know is not how it was supposed to be intended, but there's still a sense that it was very much in that c command and control approach. And actually, to me, uh, a lot of it is about rebuilding that trust that people have. Uh, we don't, do talk quite a bit about how to interact with people like that to build trust in, in democratic institutions, for example. Mm. Uh, Jack, um, isn't when we're talking about the sense of grievance, this has been uh, uh, massively accelerated, if not almost entirely are created by the so-called war on terror that began we've had 10 years off now. Um, this possibility in international relations when you hear the talk about an attack on Iran isn't over. Uh, do you think that we might be, you know, you, you've studied British and American foreign policy, wouldn't we be better dealing with it at, at, the, at the cause end here? 
I think it's perfectly fair to suggest the war on terror has failed in those things that were promised to us. It was supposed to make us safer in some way. And now there is a government-sponsored recognition that actually grievance is central to a process of radicalization that may or may not lead to terrorism, i.e. the war on terror hasn't made us safer. We don't seem to have learned the lessons of that. And you can go from the micro scale all the way back up to international relations at the macro scale, whether it's stop and search by police on the streets, whether it's um, media, uh, Islamophobia in general, whether it's British foreign policy much more generally. The lessons don't seem to have been learned, and the sense of grievance hasn't been recognised in the dominant narrative that's been put forward by the government. There is uh, a narrative targeted a section of the population, and it isn't those people that they are concerned about who might be uh, more vulnerable to a process of radicalisation. They need to bring these people back into a narrative that they can actually uh, rally around. Mm. I mean, Nick, the report says that you know there's been a kind of uh, diminution in the in the threat of Islamic terrorism, but you know you you'd be pretty foolish not to see that related to British troops getting out of Iraq, um, the end game clearly in play in Afghanistan. And you'd surely also be pretty blind if you didn't think that an attack on Iran would, would recreate it. Well, one of the things that the, the post 9-11 society has led to is a much greater acceptance for surveillance. So looking at particularly the US, uh, but also in Britain, we have had a fondness for surveillance, which has now gathered momentum because of the, uh, the post 9-11 and 7-7 threats. And one of the strange issues we've seen is the way the private sector in the surveillance industries is actually working in those countries where, in diplomatic terms, are not allies of Britain. So there's currently a letter awaiting the Prime Minister's response from Privacy International about a UK company selling surveillance kit to Iran. And one thing we're very concerned about is that while there is a foreign policy objective, there is also a counter-objective, which is technology designed purely for surveillance and, in some cases, control of uh, communications and mobile phones is being trialled in those countries where we would not regard them as allies or, indeed, role models for Britain, but then may be deployed in the UK. So looking at things like network filtering, looking at things like um, mobile phone monitoring devices, which have been recognised as potential tools by governments wishing to oppress their citizens, but being allowed by Western governments to be used in these societies where potentially we see some of the terror threat coming from. Mm. Julian, let me just give you a last chance to respond on, on the connection here between um, you know, so-called domestic uh, Islamic extremism and, uh, and foreign policy. Surely the um, decline uh, in this that you highlight in the report is due to the fact that the British are out of Iraq and look like they're quitting um, Afghanistan. Yes, I, I, I'm sure that's uh, very much part of it. Um, you know, I, I think, frankly, it would be better if we hadn't gone into Iraq in the first place. I think it was a very short-sighted thing to do, both on a foreign policy and uh, military uh, perspective, but also on a domestic uh, perspective. Um, so I hope that we will cease doing things like that, which just serve to antagonise and alienate a, a large chunk of our population. I think what Nick says about the, the growth in surveillance is, is very true. Uh, there is a constant pressure to see more and more surveillance. Um, and we do need to make sure that everybody involved uh, just takes their part to try to resist that, that constant urge. Mm. Let me just uh, push a little bit on the, on the future then, because uh, do you have a fear that if some of the talk that we're hearing out of the, um, from Ehud Barak, for instance, in Israel, from some sections of the neocons in the, in the United States of an attack on Iran, if that were to take place, do you think that, you know, by extension, uh, w we would be back where we started from? I think there's no doubt that, that if we were to get involved in, in some sort of military conflict with Iran, and I very much hope that we don't, obviously, um, but I think there's no doubt that that would certainly serve to, to alienate and annoy a large number of people inside our own country, um, and that can't be a good thing uh, at all in this perspective. Okay. Jack, final word, final word on this. Um, do, you, do you feel that, um, that some of the ways in which this, that this politics gets uh, discussed um, distorts the whole point of where the grievance comes from because it doesn't, it doesn't understand the international context in which it takes place? I think the problem with the original uh, Prevent document and its re reworked updates has been, for instance, uh, in the first Prevent, there were four mentions of foreign policy and one oblique reference to Iraq. 
It's just been recognised by the uh, Home Affairs Select Committee that grievance is central. It's one of the only things that unites people who are susceptible to a process of radicalisation. If you're still not taking seriously the, the main, the principal root cause of that sense of grievance, then you aren't doing justice to having a full comprehensive counter-terrorism strategy. Okay, well that brings us to the conclusion of uh, part one of the programme. Uh, we'll be discussing the um, case of Abu Qatada in the second part of the programme and I hope that you'll be back uh, with us to take part in that. Oasis Global Fund Manager.